Hello again. In case you've never met them before, these two young ladies are Badger and her sister, Komodo. Komodo is just an ordinary child, whereas Badger is a fire-breathing necromancer with a fairly serious vendetta against the moderately comedically named Heinous Empire. I won't spoil the reasoning for that vendetta because I'd like for this video to be able to stand alone without the backstory, but if you are interested then check out my other medieval Rimworld videos for the full story. Anyway, here they are in this cove with only some ruins, a campfire, and each other's company. They'll need to build up from this and establish a defensible and self-sufficient holdfast of sorts, from which to stage their revenge. Badger's Psylink isn't very well developed yet, and neither of the two children are particularly well skilled in anything. But that doesn't stop them from getting hungry. So we'll make a small area in which to grow rice, basically the only thing Badger is skilled enough to plant, and then get to harvesting from the local berry bushes. A few rainy nights are spent by the fire before a group of traders arrive from House Sauron. They're weaponsmiths but are nonetheless carrying some bread, so we'll buy that from them along with a cheap knife for the price of some honey. Badger equips her wooden shiv and heads out to take on a donkey in hoof to shiv combat. The uh… the donkey won. But it's bleeding to death and she isn't, so who's the real winner here? Komodo is too young to tend any of Badger's wounds, but she's only bruised, she'll be fine. Rather helpfully now, a group of sheep wander in and join the colony. I'll plant them a fairly large pen area, but it's going to take Badger quite a long time to build it since Komodo isn't being particularly helpful so far. We're prompted then to name the place, and whilst Badger Hold 2.0 is tempting, I think that the vibe here is sort of that of a temporary… well, a holdfast, so there, it's Badger's holdfast. Anyway, that donkey has finally bled out from its 300 tiny wooden shiv holes, so it's time for Badger to tear it apart with a rock on a log in a desperate attempt to feed her and her sister for another month. I think that the best way to handle this meat for now is to just hang it on a wooden frame in the rain and hope that it somehow magically becomes dried meat that will last a full year if brought indoors. With the pen done, the place is starting to look a little bit more like what it's named, a holdfast. But it's still very rough. At least Badger has a bed now. It's not a good bed, don't get me wrong, but it's better than what Komodo has, which is a loosely designated spot on the floor. And we're completely defenceless right now, so rather than building a trap hallway or arming the sisters with better weaponry, our solution to the defensive situation is to sit Badger down in their bedroom and meditate her way into being able to shoot balls of fire with her mind. The sheeps are having cute little baby sheeps, which means they're also making delicious sheeps milk. And the cute little baby sheep is actually a male, which means that it's just a meal in progress. An anima sprout has popped up, and since Badger has the nature meditation focus unlocked, I figure it's probably a good idea to harvest it for a little bit later. But around the same time, Komodo reaches seven years old, which means she can get passions in both mining and construction. There's a very useful skills around here. As well as that, she gets the night owl trait which I figure could also be nice, but to be honest it was just the best option of a mediocre bunch. More importantly than that, she's now capable of performing all manner of child labour, relieving the workload from Badger massively, allowing her to focus on the important things, like learning to throw fireballs. Anyway, a half-decent colonist named Lev dropped from the sky, from a faction that doesn't really like us all that much anyway, so I figured we might as well capture them for enslaving or recruiting. Oh, they're, they're dead. Never mind. I've got Komodo working away on making timber from raw wood whilst Badger wanders around in a daze because life in the squalor of the Holdfast was just a little too much, I guess. It's proving a little too much for our sheep as well, one of which, the ewe in fact, has died of the flu and has since been nibbled at for sustenance. Possibly by Badger and Komodo, but I'm not sure, I didn't see it happen. In any case, there goes our little sheep breeding program. I suppose we'd best make a bow so that Komodo can start learning to hunt in that case, since the locale is flooded with edible wildlife. Whilst she's out there flinging arrows in the vague direction of prey animals, a woman named Lilu has crashed nearby. I had Badger bring her in for aggressive conversion to the way of Bauks, but then I realised that she has a stab scar on her brain that's capping her consciousness at an incredible 7%. Truly a mind for the ages. So since it's currently freezing cold and she's not wearing any clothes, I just let nature take its course and a little while later the 
problem of her still being alive was resolved. I'm planning a small building here to act as a combination bedroom and workshop space since we can't just keep living in these tiny ruins next to the sheep pen. But now a single asthmatic impid has shown up looking for trouble. They run into the holdfast and start a shooting match with Komodo, which is annoying because I don't really want to throw fireballs at my own home. They, on the other hand, have no such reservations and once they've started vomiting fire, Badger might as well retaliate in kind. Not that fire damage has much effect on an impid. Eventually though, via a combination of arrows and little splintery shivings, they go down. That was pretty tough, but impids are always going to be difficult when your main defensive solution is a single fire witch. We should probably build some defenses eventually. See by contrast, this raid of humans, or rather just human, by the dynasty of Nala goes much more smoothly, thanks to his nicely flammable human flesh. I could really do with these two kids hurrying up and growing up at this point. I'm starting to get frustrated with watching them start a task only to run away and start drawing on the ground in chalk instead. Badger is nearly there anyway at 12 years and 3 seasons old, since in Rimworld 13 is considered adult. And that's okay by me because it's very handy right now. Komodo on the other hand has considerably longer to go. So fast forward a month we've planted the anima tree and Badger is all grown up. She's not spent much time learning though so the choices are limited. She's only able to choose a single passion, which goes in plants, but one of the trait options is nimble, which is pretty good considering her melee skill. The work types unlocked by adulthood aren't particularly valuable. We've carried a lot of research through from Badgerhold and I can't see us doing much smithing either to be honest. And of course in that sudden moment of growth, her clothes and backpack ripped off Hulk style, meaning we're going to need to do some tailoring. A little while later an unfortunate pair of events befall the colony, with a maddened buffalo and a singular viking descending simultaneously on the holdfast. So whilst the sisters are out dealing with the rather flammable muffalo, the sneaky lone viking slinks into the colony and steals our most valuable item, the butcher block. I mean, okay if you needed it you could have just asked honestly, whatever take it. A hare has self-tamed and I thought that it would be handy having a nuzzling animal around the colony only then to check and I don't actually think they nuzzle. I think hares should nuzzle but hey whatever. More importantly it's very very cold right now, rather uncomfortably so. More importantly it's plant killingly cold. The indoor temperature is solved rather easily with a campfire and the remaining sheep don't give a crap how cold it is, it's just the rice that struggles. Meanwhile, Badger's fire flinging abilities have advanced to the self explosion level, which is actually a very powerful psycast that I keep forgetting to use. So I decided to give fire magic based hunting a go when a mad ibex ran at the base. It went about as well as you'd expect to be honest, which is to say Badger set the animal pen on fire. Another weaponsmith's caravan swung by and I decided to buy a better knife for Badger so she could stop using that little wooden shiv only to then have someone drop from the sky and make a bloody mess, dropping their nomad mace in the process, a weapon considerably better suited to bashing at enemy armour in these medieval times. Now anyway let's continue the trend of extreme suffering during raids against single impids. Because here's Mo with their bow. Badger runs into combat with her new and shiny weaponry and is immediately covered in fiery impid sick. She self explodes in response but as we've talked about already, that isn't really doing much against impids. Before you know it Badger's on the floor rolling around with her face on fire and Mo scoops her up, intending to kidnap her. So it's up to Komodo to save her sister, flinging crappy stone arrows at Mo as she attempts to leave, which does to be fair get the job done. But in the fires Badger lost her nose, so now she's hideous. But hey she's a fire witch, I assume it's pretty normal for them to be missing a little bit of their face. As a result she goes on a sad wander whilst Komodo is moving furniture into their new home. Perhaps the new slightly less shitty barracks will help with her sadness. It's been almost a year and honestly the place hasn't come very far. But there's only two people here and one is still a child so perhaps some recruitment wouldn't be the worst idea. And after watching a grizzly bear fight some traders, a wookie named Kel Collier drop from the sky and they're pretty good. The only minor downside being the gourmand trait. 
He can live in a slate brick hole next to the new barracks to be slowly converted whilst Badger and Komodo have a laugh with a single raider from the dynasty of Nala, setting her on fire and then giving her the old runaround. Things progress in a calm manner for a little while, with Badger gaining the explosion psycast and Komodo growing a little older, gaining a further passion in shooting. And then when we're finally starting to put up a wall, House Hess show up in real, actual armor. It's just one guy, but he's still looking pretty scary with his armor and pick. I didn't want to put anyone in range of that war pick, and Komodo's stone arrows weren't going to make it through his armor, so this was essentially just a case of running him around, throwing fireballs at him until he eventually fell over. Naturally, I want his armor now, but whilst we're stealing it from his writhing body, which is perfectly acceptable, he died, which makes it no longer acceptable to wear. I don't really get that honestly. In the medieval period it would have been entirely acceptable to pilfer some nicer armor on a battlefield when on campaign, so I'm going to install a mod to remove the tainted debuff. Badger is a necromantic fire witch, she can wear some armor from a corpse, and Komodo needs a better bow. Unfortunately neither of the sisters are capable of crafting anything more powerful than a curved stick and some string. Kelkolion, on the other hand, is quite capable and he'll be recruited soon, but first, that hair that joined earlier has gone feral, so let's just shoot it right quick. Alright, Kelkolia is on board, so let's get him working on that bow. We're going to need to start playing with more advanced production now anyway, so let's build a long extension in which to eventually house various workbenches. First though, Neanderthals. Two of them, from the Treaty of Kikmuk. Here to try and get at our, um... Well, I don't actually know, they're just... They're just kind of here for some reason. But they're flammable and they're not wearing any armor, so it's really not a problem. Afterwards, some traders were hanging around at the colony and I saw something that I don't think I've ever seen before. They grabbed some of my food. Look at that. Ketilvast just grabs some dried meat like it's his. Dickhead. Anyway, the eternal enemy are here. The Anus Empire, with their axes and clubs. But we have fireballs and arrows, so it's really not an issue. They're dealt with rather swiftly. Shortly afterwards, Badger gains another Psylink level and picks up the Eye Laser Psycast. It's a very good one, that. I figure at this point that it might be a good idea to start taming and breeding horses, since eventually the goal is to go out and burn some stuff down on the world map after all. And with a Wookiee in the Holdfast, it's not going to be particularly difficult to do some taming. The place is starting to look more like it's supposed to be here now, rather than just being a temporary deal just to survive. But it's definitely still very cramped, especially having to build around the anima tree's exclusion zone. But I sort of like it. The limitation makes you get more creative. Anyway, another war merchant shows up and I figure it could be worth buying this excellent quality crossbow from them. Though I later find that it's more of a pain than you'd expect, because for some reason in Combat Extended, Crossbow bolts are really very heavy compared to arrows, so your pawns won't pick many of them up and quickly run out in combat. So if you notice later on that I've gone back to bows, that would be why. Going back to the permanence of the holdfast thing, we're building a little warehouse into the mountainside here because currently our food just lives on the floor of our original building and everything else we own is just sitting under a canopy in the animal pen. And here's something else that I've never seen in Rimworld. Poor Kelkolia was struck directly by lightning. It didn't hurt him too badly, it's just a little burn. I just realized that I don't think I've ever actually had that happen in all of my hours in Rimworld. Never mind, he's fine. Now, back to more Rimworldy stuff. I build a little combat tunnel out of bones, which aren't flammable, but they do have a rather low hit point value. So this wouldn't make a fantastic permanent solution, but it will do for now and we have plenty of bones. It's not a trap hallway or anything like that, but I just figured it'd be nice to have a more controlled place in which to meet raiders and the like. Another thing I thought would be nice is a little cave in which to burn corpses, since Badger can make fire with her brain after all. House Hess have shown up again though, a single armoured fighter, who goes down without issue courtesy of Badger's eye lasers. And whilst stealing her armour and beating her to death, a massive group of ducks wander in and self-tame. They'll need a new pen area, and a large one too, so I'll plan a wall up to the north purely to house the colony's waterfall. But they'll have to wait, because another lone viking has shown up in his flop hat, looking to take our things. A swift laser to the face puts him in his place, and we can then get back to work. But progress is still pretty slow, 
despite Badger having grown up and having recruited Kelkolia. Komodo is also nearly an adult now, so that will help a bit, but as ever, it feels like we're short on hands here. In a similar vein, it's probably time for Badger to invest some side juice towards more utilitarian goals, unlocking the Technomancer tree so that she can grab men sometime soon, since it's just too good to not have. Alright, let's zoom out for a minute. We've been here for not far off two years now, and the duck pen is finished. Our mighty quacking flock is fully housed. And zooming back in again, Komodo is finally an adult. An adult 13 year old, anyway. She gets the kind trait, and furthers her passions in mining and construction, as well as getting a new passion in cooking. All of which is very nice, but most nice is that she won't sit around scrawling on the floor in chalk anymore. Now, back to the ducks. They're already experiencing a population explosion. I don't really know how useful it is to have a massive flock of ducks around the place, but, you know, thematically it's nice if nothing else. Some more traders were hanging around the holdfast, eating our food and generally making a mess, when a group of manhunter cats appeared. They just caught the traders as they left the map. They didn't drop anything particularly valuable, but it was a good watch. Now a woman named Miller drops from the sky, which I realise seems a little weird in a medieval overhaul, but I prefer to see this as a medieval planet that still exists in Rimworld's usual lore, if that helps to explain it. Anyway. Miller is psychically hypersensitive and tough, so it's probably worth popping her into a slate box and convincing her to take that burqa off and join the gang. It's currently almost 50 degrees C outside, by the way. Luckily we can solve that for the most part by putting containers of wet wood in everyone's bedroom. Unbelievably, yet another sky human falls down. Laporte, who is staggeringly ugly and has a chemical fascination. They also have a nice backpack, so... We'll be having that. Anyway, back to Miller. It's been a while and not much else has happened, so she's getting close to being converted. But she's first decided to have a go at escaping for some reason. I sell Kelkolia, armoured up as he is, but unarmed, to go and try and take her down safely with the help of a horse using his Wookiee magic. However, it turns out that a Hyperweave Burka is surprisingly effective at shrugging off large furry fists and the hooves of a stallion so I had to take the risk and send in Badger with her Gladius, which turned out fine and now Miller's back where she belongs, minus her Hyperweave Burka. A little later the space situation is getting worse as the colony continues to grow, so I'm having Komodo mine out basically any tile that isn't classed as under mountain, for infestation avoidance purposes. It won't help much, but if it lets us squeeze in another decent bedroom then it's worth it. So the place is sort of steadily chugging along now, but it's important to remember that this colony exists only to further Badger and Komodo's capabilities in the field of vengeance. Miller can help further that vengeance now, because she's finally been recruited. She's a skilled builder and grower, which are both very handy. But now I have that irritating realisation that I need some steel to make an ideogram, with which to keep people happy through ritual sacrifice. Thankfully, when things drop from the sky, they bring steel slag with them. So when a load of cargo pods full of gemstones arrived, I was more excited about the slag chunks. Something else fell from the sky. But they're mediocre. I'm only interested in their greatsword, since they won't be needing it anymore. Right, with a furnace made we can get the steel we need and make that their temple. It's the wonkiest room I've ever made in a Rimworld colony, but I really just need it to serve its basic purpose and nothing more. So it's fine. That function being hosting high jubilees that attract new colonists. The first of which to arrive this way is Razes, a waster, which as I've discovered before, usually seems like it will be a pain in the arse initially, until you remember that you can just make them psychite tea to feed their dependency. He kind of fills roles that are already pretty well filled in the holdfast, but it's fine. I've said a million times that the thing you need most in this Rimworld overhaul is just more hands. Anyway, enough lovely home building. The Anus Empire are here again, in the largest numbers we've seen so far. Two groups of them. The first of which die to the traps that have finally been installed in the entryway, and then the second group die to the more traditional, badger hold style methods. There were a few amongst the raiders with some pretty impressive gear, but they appear to have all ran, leaving behind only corpses wearing the more pedestrian stuff. It's been well over 100 days here now, 
I can't remember exactly when we arrived, but it was something like day 260 after the fall of Badgerhold, and it's now 411. As is tradition, the animals are mostly starving to death, and the people food supply is a finely balanced thing, reliant at least partially on hunting even still. At least partially, the animals are starving because there's just too many of them. We can cull some horses, because realistically we just need a breeding pair and a couple spare for caravans. Speaking of culling, a large group of manhunter rats needed to be burned and stabbed to death by Badger before it was followed by a rather frighteningly large Neanderthal raid. Which did actually turn out not to be so bad thanks to their lack of armour and generally flammable nature. I like recruiting Neanderthals, but pretty much everyone here is either just bad or is missing something important after the combat. So sometime later, Badger gets another Silink level, and I think it might finally be time to start spending some points on the necromancy side of her magic. Though it's also going to be very important to just spend some time increasing her basic psycasting stats. When you're running a kind of lone magical warrior like this, they have to have a decently high neural heat limit for spamming their vile magics all over the place. Evidently the gods are unhappy with this idea, as currently the anima tree is on fire after a lightning strike. In response, the gang have a party, which I'm choosing to believe is a ritual designed to appease the angry thunder gods. I thought that that hadn't worked when a group of rhinos went for revenge and knocked down Komodo, initially believing that it was the result of another errant lightning strike, but now I realise that it's just because Komodo was using the rhinos as cover whilst hunting Ibex and that plan didn't work. So whilst she's on the ground post rhino attack, the rest of the colony have to slowly kill the remaining rhinos off. Earlier on we had gotten some glitter world medicine as a gift from visitors, so we'll just use them to heal the crush injury to Komodo's kidney. Also Razaz can finally get his psychite fix. Someone's brewed up a load of the good addictive tea for him and I've set him on a drug policy to have one per day. Once again, the Anus Empire, who are presumably by this point beginning to figure out what's going on here at the Holdfast, have sent another raid. But as usual, they're not actually too difficult to send running. Fire is quite scary, I get it. A while later, as I'm just sitting, enjoying my view of the colony, everything turns green as toxic fallout blankets the area. Oh dear, this is probably going to kill a lot of ducks, isn't it? During the green era of the Holdfast, Razez got an eye bitten out by Manhunter Hyenas. But aside from that, I basically just sat and watched as all of the livestock either died or became rather more cancerous than they should be. Once it ends, we can go through the biological wreckage to evaluate what remains. Quite a few very unwell and probably not edible ducks remain, as well as just two horses. An adult female and a male foal presumably mother and child. But RimWorld doesn't model animal incest, thankfully. Does it even model human incest? I don't know, whatever. We're going to have a high jubilee just to cheer everyone up. Afterwards, a temporarily paralysed man named Glasses drops from the sky. And I don't tend to take in paralysed folks as they eat food and give nothing back, but Glasses has a good combination of traits and passions and we have enough dried meat to feed a hundred colonists, so he can just quietly lay in the corner of the room I'm building for stone cutting. He won't like it, but they can't do anything about it. They'll lie there in the corner for about 40 days. Annoyingly though, because they're iron willed, they can't be converted from their strange religion through normal methods. Their certainty will grow faster than it would fall. The only way to do it is through conversion rituals, which you can't perform on someone that's paralysed apparently. The Lanoa Covenant are here in numbers now to have a go at Badger's Holdfast for some reason. We didn't do anything to them, but here they are, wanting to feel the wrath of the eye lasers. Poor Razez got his face further messed up in this fight, getting his nose mashed in somehow. And then a high mate falls from the sky who I considered capturing, but instead decided to just rescue for some relations with their faction. And then they died before making it to the cave I'd reserved for them anyway. And now good old House Ambois want in on the action, raiding with a fairly substantial blob of dudes. One of whom is Glasses the sleepy person's uncle. If he's killed in the defences that will make Glasses sad, but Glasses can't move so I don't care how he feels. There are quite a few of them, and they're quite well armoured, so this defence isn't actually easy. And in fact, Razez has been killed. 
beheaded, in fact. Damn, that's actually quite sad. I really liked Razes for some reason. So we'll make a grand sarcophagus of iron and build a tomb around it. Badger built it and apparently, if you squint, it depicts that one time that a silver meteorite fell near the Holdfast. The gang held a funeral after popping Razes into his new home, and as is tradition, it was lacklustre. Shortly after, the Lanoa Covenant come back for another go. These raids are getting pretty seriously tough, especially now as we're down a fairly competent melee combatant. But as ever, large quantities of magical fire does get the job done. Meanwhile, Glasses is laying in his corner with food poisoning, drowning in his own sick. Once he's been cleaned off, we can get back to Razes's tomb, which has a neat statue and plush carpets. I do like to properly commemorate the dead in my colonies, especially when they die in combat. We'll have another High Jubilee, which for a change brings a colonist, a brave underground Eritakin called Orr. Those goddang anuses are back again though, attacking in a few groups, the first of which flees after facing the trap hallway and a couple of arrows before the rest are burnt to death. I planned on capturing DeLong from amongst the wounded, but he died before Badger could finish tending him. On the one hand, that's a shame, but it would also feel quite dirty recruiting from the eternal enemy like that. Now that we have a few extra hands here, I can give more of Badger's time to meditation, shifting her focus over from defending against the Anus Menace towards attacking them. We have been here for about 200 days now, after all, with the total time since arrival clicking towards 500. Unrelatedly, I realised at this point that I should probably swap out the psychoid plant for something more currently useful, even though it would feel like erasing the last remaining piece of Razas. Regardless of my feelings, we dug up the young psychoid and replaced it with Devil Strand for some reason, despite feeling like we probably won't be here long enough to make use of it. The gods were swift in their punishment for this slight. A cold snap wiped all my crops. And then came the Manhunter guinea pigs. The cold span ends and Glasses is finally up and about, which means he finally needs converting. He's thrown on the floor of the temple and everyone yells at him until he submits to the ways of Baux. Ladies and gentlemen, we got him. Which means now I have to make him an actual bedroom. Also, he's actually still upset about things from his old ideology despite claiming to have given it up. Oh, and once again, House Ambois are here. Badger, do the eye laser thing again. This, as usual, does the trick and sends the raiders on their way, but it also does rather significantly weaken the walls. Apparently, though, it also does the trick for Glasses, who got Badger's attention and won her affection by describing her as delicate quarry. That probably wouldn't work on me, but they're lovers now. Good for them. Speaking of glasses, he's finally got a bedroom. Very good. Badger's psychic powers continue to grow steadily. A pair of dare wander in and I decided to give her a test. She can get the job done, but she's definitely no cam call, that's for sure. I think we'll turn these dare into rugs. And just after butchering them both, a bulk goods trader arrived, so I figured I should be able to offload all the valuable antlers. Unfortunately though, as is often the case in medieval overhaul, there's not actually much worth buying and the traders aren't carrying enough silver for me to just flog them a load of stuff and hoard the shiny silver. Anyway, check those rugs out. God damn, that's good. Now, it feels like in this playthrough I've done a great many things to earn divine retribution, but for once it appears they are pleased with me for something. A rather uncreatively named waster, called Kuzwaste, falls from the sky through the roof of Razes's tomb. His traits are mediocre, his stats are decent, but more importantly, he fell from the sky through the roof of the tomb of our fallen waster. I mean, come on, if that's not a sign, then I honestly couldn't tell you what is. We clearly need to recruit him. Any other course of action would be an affront to Baux. A small gang of manhunting diabores are running at the colony, which, though fearsome, are in a similar fashion to most living things, also flammable. So after dispatching them on day 499, I think that it's finally time for young Badger, who's not quite so young anymore, to visit her home. Badger Hold. 
she fetches her horse and heads off alone. Okay, so it turns out you can't actually visit abandoned colonies, so you'll just have to imagine the ruins of Badgerhold sparking a necromantic flame in the eyes of Badger. I know somewhere you can definitely visit. The nearest Anus settlement, named Coyote's Fortress on the Thicket. Badger arrives at the small fortress and sweeps across it as a whirling fiery dervish, delivering swift but agonizing death to any unfortunate enough to call it home. Not even the cows were spared. Let this serve as a prelude to the real campaign yet to come. For now, Badger returns to the Holdfast, with a new coldness in her burning eyes. Please remain indoors. This is a crossfire you wouldn't want to find yourself in. Fire magic is nothing if not indiscriminate. Until next time, thanks for watching, and goodbye.